access to specialised victim support services for disabled women who have experienced violence. A summary report. Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, Queraum, Cultural and Social Research, and Sabine Mandel, Anna Schaschner, Claudia Sprenger, Julia Planitzer. October 2014. The research was carried out within the project Access to Specialised Victim Support Services for Women with Disabilities Who Have Experienced Violence, with financial support from the Daphne 3 programme of the European Union, just slash 2011 slash DAP slash AG slash 3293. The contents of this document are the sole responsibility of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, BIM, and Quaraum, and can in no way be taken to reflect the views of the European Commission. Abbreviations used in this report. DPOs, Disabled People's Organisations. NAP, National Action Plans. ULOs, User-Led Organisations. UNCRPD, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. VAW, Violence Against Women. Introduction. This summary encompasses the main findings of the Daphne 3 project, access to specialised victim support services for women with disabilities who have experienced violence. The comparative EU project from 2013 to 2015, has been carried out by four European countries, including Austria, Germany, Iceland and the United Kingdom. In Austria, the Lusvig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, Project Coordinator, together with the organisations Queraum, Cultural and Social Research Institute and NINLIL, Association for Empowerment and Counselling for Women with Disabilities, were responsible for the implementation. In Germany, the University of Gießen, in Iceland, the University of Iceland, and in United Kingdom, the Universities of Leeds and Glasgow were the three other project partners. A literature review on the interplay between violence, gender and disability was conducted. It revealed a clear absence of data, particularly with regards to how disabled women experience violence and their access to specialised victim support services. By this term, mainstream services are addressed, such as shelters, women's counselling services, helplines, intervention centres for women survivor of domestic violence, etc. Among the very few studies, Schrottel et al., 2012, have published the only representative study on the extent of violence against disabled women in Germany. The study revealed that women with disabilities have experienced violence two to three times more often than women in the average population. In relation to the access of women with disability exposed to violence and getting support at service providers, Swedland Nozek 2000 pointed out, for example, that the majority of shelters, helplines, counselling services, etc., seldom explicitly include services for disabled women in their service philosophies, policies, planning and programming. Therefore, the project aimed to assess the range of different experiences of violence against disabled women and their use of support structures. In addition, Specialised victim support services were interviewed about their experiences and capabilities in terms of counselling and accommodating disabled women. The project focused on three components. 1. Assessing the legal and policy framework. 2. Generating extensive empirical data by surveying disabled or deaf women through focus group discussions, in-depth interviews and service providers through online survey, interviews with staff members, and three, developing good practice examples and recommendations. For each component, national reports and an associated comparative report was prepared, 
identifying the most prominent issues, including the commonalities and differences between the four countries' issues. The main findings of the projects, including the final short report recommendations for service providers and a brochure for disabled women, are available to access in easy language, sign language and audio files. All products are available on the project website http colon slash slash women hyphen disabilities hyphen violence dot human rights dot at slash publications. The legal and policy framework. At national level, all four countries Austria, Germany, Iceland and the United Kingdom have a broad range of legislation in place. Common ground in all four countries is that existing law therefore covers both the issue of violence against women and the issue of protecting disabled people, although there are significant gaps in relation to protecting disabled women if they are exposed to violence. In addition to the legal gaps, the evidence suggests that disabled women face further obstacles in obtaining access to justice. Some of these obstacles prevent women from seeking help at all. Disabled women may grow up not feeling they are able to make any demands. Additionally, the reports show that disabled people are often regarded as less credible and less believed by those in authority. The criminal justice system and social workers often hold judgmental attitudes about disabled women's sexuality, for example. If cases do go to court, women are often not provided with necessary accessible information and knowledge. The gap between the numbers of disabled women who have experienced violence and those who do not have access to justice is significant. Findings about violence from disabled women these findings reflect the experiences and views of disabled women stemming from the empirical research. 106 women participating in focus group discussions and in-depth interviews carried out with 59 women. Experiences of violence. Women reported a great variety of different forms of violence experienced during their childhood, adolescence and adulthood including psychological, emotional, physical, sexual violence and institutional abuse. One woman stated, There is no place where violence could not take place. A majority of women experienced domestic violence and for the minority of women still living or who had lived in institutions, violence and discrimination is or was omnipresent. Disabled women like non-disabled women, are at risk to a wide range of different forms of violence. However, given the particular situations and the nature of their abuse, is likely to be more complex, especially if they are dependent on individuals, institutions and services for the support they need. This highly increases the risk of being violated and being kept from seeking support. Psychological violence featured very frequently in women's accounts. In all countries, women spoke of being treated with contempt, threats, oppression and of being frightened. For women living in their own homes, depending on a partner who was at the same time their care person, isolation, manipulation and control were very often huge issues. A common manifestation of abuse was emotional violence and prejudice. In childhood, many women, especially those with learning difficulties and sensory impairments, emphasised that they were exposed to bullying in schools and residential care homes. In addition, some women experienced harassment at their workplaces or reported about stalking, mainly by people they knew. Furthermore, women who were disabled since childhood and youth often experienced psychological violence by parents which increased the risk of violence during their later life. Physical violence was also a common experience shared by most of the women, illustrated by examples that ranged from being hit, spat on, punched and kicked. Physical violence was severe to the extent of being choked or attempted murder by suffocation. 
Impairment-specific physical violence included being denied assistance and coercion to undergo forced sterilisation, being less able to defend oneself, being isolated, or having fewer opportunities was often correlated with increased violence. Sexual violence was among the most frequently experienced types of violence. Disabled women had been exposed to sexual abuse during childhood and adolescence. This ranged from touching genitals, sexual harassment in the public, to repeated rape, sometimes sustained over years. The still prevailing view that girls and disabled women are asexual was considered to facilitate and encourage the crossing of boundaries and the perpetrating of sexual violence. Moreover, a lack of sex education may lead to girls and women not knowing about boundaries or being able to identify what is violence, harassment or unacceptable treatment. Abuse in institutional settings Women living in institutions recounted disregard and violation of privacy, neglect, being pressurised to do things they did not want to, and being humiliated. Service-related violence was always characterised by control and domination by staff members, which often led to disregard of respect of their self-determination and autonomy. The life of women in institutions was very often affected by sexual violence and abuse. Forced marriage is a severe women's right violation and a relevant experience of some of the disabled women in the UK study. In Iceland, the problem of losing legal capacity was raised in connection with the effect that women were completely hindered from making their own decisions, e.g relating to the place where they wanted to live. Apart from this, financial dependence on partners, institutions, especially in connection with an uncertain legal residence status, were mentioned as the source of abusive experiences. Perpetrators. During childhood and adolescence, the perpetrators were most often fathers, or to a lesser extent, mothers and other family members, such as brothers, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers, stepfathers, stepmothers, etc. Some were people closely associated with the family or child. Teachers, neighbours, caregivers, drivers, therapists, doctors, etc. On the institutional level, other residents, service staff, drivers, doctors and therapists are frequently mentioned. Whilst in some cases fathers continued to abuse during adulthood, increasingly partners and spouses became the predominant perpetrators. Rather than the characteristics of the perpetrators, it was the positions of power that other people held in relation to disabled women that participants identified as the biggest problem. What works in support and assistance? Disabled women discussed what was helpful in tackling the violence and abusive situations they experienced. They identified three main areas, supportive or unsupportive relationships with individuals, assistance from services and things that help them muster personal resources and strength. In all instances and throughout their lives, supportive contact with other people was the factor that disabled women experiencing violence found most helpful. Supportive relationships with other people. Some women described the importance of family members who help them to recover from the effects of violence. In some cases, however, women reported a lack of support from family members. That was experienced as having a severe impact, especially in childhood, given the fact that support or therapeutic services often cannot be reached without family members' assistance. Other people who frequently were mentioned as particularly helpful were relatives and friends, teachers, instructors, doctors, social workers, mobile caretakers, psychologists and psychotherapists. Assistance from services Formal and informal support services were also vital sources of support 
and all the disabled women interviewed agreed that they are important. However, support from services in different countries was experienced in different ways. Disabled women reported not being taken seriously or not receiving adequate assistance due to lack of disability knowledge or the necessary access to resources. In all countries, specialised informal services that were particularly helpful included peer counselling, empowerment movements, self-defence classes and self-help groups. Overall, few women reported the violence to the police and the majority of them were not taken seriously. However, some pointed out that they received positive assistance from individual police officers, judges or other officials. Personal resources and strength Quite often, a number of small steps were taken towards establishing a violence-free, independent life. Disabled women emphasised the way that the support of others helped them to draw their own boundaries concerning acceptable behaviour and to name violence for what it was. Many women used different ways of strengthening their self-confidence by, for example, writing down their thoughts, participating at dancing classes, yoga, relaxation technique training, having animals, educational programmes, getting employment, etc. Examples of the ways that women took more control of their lives was often through getting personal assistance that could replace the abusive care of individual perpetrators or institutions and being more assertive in their dealings with others. Women's knowledge about rights and the use of services. There was a great deal of variation in disabled women's knowledge about their rights. Although a small number were well informed, most had a more limited or partial picture of just one aspect of the law. Most women had used forms of therapy services at some points in their lives. Some had spent some time in clinics and with private psychologists. A few women in all countries had used counselling centres and shelters, but some women with sensory or physical impairments describe barriers to accessing these services. For many women, a lack of knowledge and information was combined with concern about whether the services would be accessible for them. Only a minority of participants stated that the service provision in their area was adequate. Experiences of barriers A formidable array of barriers was identified by disabled women when they tried to secure assistance and a violence-free life. Women had frequent dependence on perpetrators for assistance in their daily lives, both in their homes and in institutional settings. They were often hesitant to report perpetrators in case appropriate alternative assistance was not available. Specialised service providers often created barriers to access. Some women were not believed or were ignored. There was a lack of accessible information, inaccessible services, negative attitudes by service staff or a lack of funding for accessible support. Power imbalance. Disabled women were clear that violence stemmed from power imbalances between themselves and perpetrators, but also in society more generally. Power imbalances underpinned violent relationships and for some women, violence was reported to be unremitting over long periods of time. Relative powerlessness was identified as stemming from a number of factors, including the perception that women could not fight back, the degree of control exercised over women, as by residential service providers, for example, and restrictions on reporting due to fear of losing things that were needed, such as assistance or accessible housing. Findings from service providers The following results gained from an empirical research encompassed an online survey with 602 service providers. Austria, 77 services. Germany, 442 services. United Kingdom, 73 services. Iceland, 10 services. Reduced sample due to the smaller overall population size. Most organisations were refuges, 
women's advice centres, women's helplines and intervention centres for women's survivors and 54 interviews with staff members. Accessibility for impairment specific groups of women. Service providers were asked to complete a self-assessment to identify the accessibility of their service to women according to women's impairments, particularly women with sensory impairments, including blind, partially sighted or deaf women, were barred from access. To a certain extent, women with mobility impairments also lacked accessible services. In Austria, Germany, Iceland and the UK there were none, or just a very small number of organisations and services, 2% to 13%, which were completely accessible for disabled women. Women with the label of learning difficulties were also not served by accessible services, even though the rate of access is a little higher, 9% to 13%. The accessibility for women with physical impairments is more positive, however it varies greatly. The percentages in each country study range from 9% Germany to 46% Austria, United Kingdom and even 66% Iceland. In all instances, access for women with mental health service need was most frequently reported in the interviews and in the survey 27% to 70%. The participating organisations and services were also asked to what extent they are able to support women who live in inpatient or semi-residential facilities for disabled people and or people who need care or assistance. The highest rate here was access in Iceland, 40%, followed by the UK, 29%, with again Austria, 13%, and Germany 6%, the lowest percentages. Measures to ensure accessibility. Service providers were asked about the kinds of measures they had taken to ensure accessibility. Those most commonly described were counselling for women with mental health service need and information in easy language for women with the label of learning difficulty or services for women with chronic ill health. The lowest percentages, between 0% and 4%, were given for sensory access provision, such as braille, signage or guidance systems for blind women or the use of lights for doorbells. Access to information and public relations. With the exception of some organisations that focus on actively working with disabled women and providing accessible information, the majority of participating organisations did not engage in accessible activities. Some organisations lacked awareness about promoting existing services and many reported that they do not have enough resources to cope with the extra counselling and accommodation needed to protect disabled or deaf women against violence. Cooperation and networking a large proportion of service providers had contact with other services, healthcare organisations, counselling services and other organisations that were in the same or similar sector and collaborated with them in various ways. The number of contacts were lower with services for disabled people, a third, and for disabled people's organisations, DPOs, a fifth especially for refuges and helplines. Although disabled women experienced violence from a number of sources, hate crime and institutional violence were largely treated as DPO responsibilities and domestic violence, that of women's services. Challenges of implementing accessibility identified by service providers. In all countries, a number of common themes emerged when talking about challenges in implementing accessibility. Service providers spoke about being limited by lack of funds. All said that services experienced lack of capacity, resources and knowledge in order to be able to assist women adequately. Another challenge service providers identified was the far-reaching taboo of the topic of disabled women who experience violence. Therefore, 
it seems to be very necessary to focus on specific public relations and awareness raising activities on a political and social level. Finally, accessibility in a broad sense was seen by many as something that was not achievable and this reduced their motivation for starting to change. Good practice and recommendations. Representatives of specialist victim support services and participants of national stakeholder meetings were asked about helpful practices. From this good practice, the national research teams then identified up to five recommendations based on commonly developed guiding principles and criteria for good practice. Disabled and non-disabled women who worked in different areas of support and services with women after violence developed this guidance. This included members of the advisory boards and other stakeholders that participated in project meetings. The recommendations presented here are aimed at improving the quality of support services and facilitating accessibility for disabled women who have experienced violence. Furthermore, the recommendations put forward in different countries were, for the most, the same or addressed very similar issues. This indicates that there are certain key issues that require special attention and focus. The recommendations address different target groups, including EU policymakers, national policymakers, specialised victim support services, disability services and user-led organisations, ULOs. Recommendations for EU policy. Emphasise barrier-free access to information. Findings of the project highlight a lack of accessible information about violence against disabled women or accessible support option for survivors of violence. It is important that information is made available in barrier-free formats for disabled women. The EU should promote the provision of accessible information for women with disabilities. It should fund projects that include creating and disseminating accessible information about violence against disabled women and the support options accessible to them. Address access to justice for women with disabilities. Participants in the project called for improved access to information about the rights of disabled women and facilitated access to legal assistance. It is important that information about legal procedures is made more readily available and accessible to disabled women. The EU should take measures to facilitate access to legal assistance for disabled women and promote barrier-free information about rights, for example by requiring legislation and policies in EU member states. Promote awareness raising about violence against disabled women. The findings showed that when disabled women speak up about violence they have experienced, they are very often not believed. The EU should promote and fund awareness raising campaigns that tackle discrimination and prejudice against disabled women. Focus on disabled women. Violence perpetrated against disabled women is intrinsically connected to their marginalisation, exclusion in society and their overall societal status. The EU should be increasingly engaged in the participation and inclusion of disabled women and should promote and fund projects that address their marginal status and exclusion as well as strengthening their position and value in civil society. Recommendations for national policy. Make a commitment to improve access to support for disabled women. Political can improve access to support for disabled women. As Article 16 of the CRPD outlines, States should take all appropriate measures to promote the recovery of disabled people who have become victims of violence. It is important that states make a commitment, prioritise this issue and fund the implementation necessary to facilitate access to support. 
states should make law reforms or put in place legislation and policies to ensure adequate, accessible support and information for disabled women who have experienced violence. Increase funds to specialist services to promote access and support for disabled women. Many specialist victim support or women's services fail to provide accessible support to disabled women. Many participants in the project reported inadequate funding and financial difficulties as the main reasons for limited access. Funds to these services should be increased and special attention and resources focused on projects that address support with disabled women. Specific funds should be provided to organisations facilitating access, support and information for disabled or deaf women after violence. Increase funds to user-led support. The findings of the empirical reports show that many disabled women value self-help groups and peer support, led and controlled by disabled women and survivors themselves. It is important to promote the establishment of such support options, actively support those organisations and provide them with ongoing funding. Promote support in rural areas. Disabled women that live in rural areas generally have less access to resources and support. States should emphasise access to support and information for disabled women in rural areas. Improve access to information. Information about violence and support should be made accessible. States should ensure access to information for disabled women about how to recognise violence and about accessible support options. Such information should be provided in accessible formats, for example, easy words and pictures, braille, sign language videos and audio format. It should be made available in public spaces and through different mediums to reach a larger population of disabled women, for example through radio, television and in print media. They should organise and fund projects where disabled women who have survived violence play a key role in planning, designing and broadcasting information through various media outlets. It is important that all measures to promote information should be developed in collaboration with disabled or deaf women to enhance the relevance, efficiency and expertise of the projects. Promote sex education. States should ensure the quality of sex education for disabled women in schools and in institutions where disabled women live, study and work. It is important that information about sexual and reproductive rights of disabled women is integrated into school and other curricula. Such education should also promote self-empowerment and help women distinguish inappropriate, neglectful, violent or abusive behaviour. Promote awareness raising about violence against disabled women. It is important that the issue of violence is openly discussed and embedded in a broader discourse stressing the necessity of inclusion and equality of disabled people. In accordance with Article 8 of the CRPD, states should undertake measures to raise awareness about societal perceptions of disabled people and violence against them. Such awareness raising should aim to reduce the prejudice and discrimination experienced by disabled or deaf women who speak up about the violence they experience. Promote knowledge among professionals. It is important that professionals who work with disabled women or in support services receive training about violence against disabled women, access and support requirements. Disability equality training should also be integrated into vocational training of professionals within the healthcare and rehabilitation sectors, education, disability services, specialised victim services and criminal justice systems. This training should aim to address discrimination and provide a deeper understanding about the barriers faced by disabled or deaf women. Those training activities should be carried out by, or in collaboration, 
with disabled women who have experienced violence. Promote the participation of disabled or deaf women. Participants in the study stressed the importance of measures to promote the social and political status of disabled women. States, governments and municipalities should take measures to combat common stereotypes by promoting projects and initiatives where disabled or deaf women are in the forefront and represented in civil society and media. Disability equality training and standards for media representatives should be organised and supported, preferably by or in collaboration with disabled or deaf women. Endorse independent living and guarantee safety in institutions. Disabled women who are dependent upon support services are more at risk of violence and abuse. Services provided for disabled women must promote their empowerment and support them to exercise their self-determination. States, governments and municipalities should promote, fund and execute projects that promote and deliver independent living. Supporting the individual self-determination of disabled or deaf women. Where women do not have capacity to make decisions, advocates should be appointed to act in their best interests. For women living still in institutions, a safe and violence-free life must be guaranteed through comprehensive mechanisms and measures to fully protect and support women who experience violence. Improve access to justice. Many participants, both disabled women and support service providers, stressed the importance of improving access to legal assistance. States need to develop and disseminate accessible information about the rights of disabled women and facilitate their access to legal aid. States should review or amend legislation to facilitate the safe participation of disabled women in legal proceedings. They should furthermore establish laws that make the exclusion of perpetrators from the home possible rather than requiring the woman to leave. This can be particularly important in cases when refuges are inaccessible for disabled or deaf women. States should ensure that the justice sector is supportive of disabled women and provide disability equality training and education about violence against disabled women and their rights to lawyers, judges, victim support services and police officers. In addition, anti-discrimination laws and support measures should be more accessible and provided routinely for disabled or deaf women. Recommendations for disability services. Actively engage in the fight against violence. Participants in the project called out for increased involvement of disability service providers in the engagement to tackle violence against disabled women. It is important that disability service providers recognise that disabled women are at greater risk, especially of sexual violence, abuse and neglect, and that they find ways to address that in the organisation of their services. Disability service providers should develop protocols for the identification of situations of violence and address risk factors in their services. They should furthermore make reforms aimed at eliminating discrimination against service users and promote their independent living and self-determination. Improve access to information. Disability service providers are in a unique position and could have an important role in providing information about accessible support to disabled women who use their services. Disability service providers could therefore participate in outreach projects in collaboration with disabled women who are survivors, specialist services, DPOs and ULOs. They should disseminate barrier-free information about violence and provide details of accessible support for disabled women who have experienced violence. Furthermore, disability service providers should take measures to improve access to information about the rights of disabled women and facilitate their access to legal assistance. 
Promote awareness raising. Disability services should emphasise awareness raising about the rights of disabled people, discrimination and violence against them. They should participate in projects that increase awareness among general public as well as among specific professional groups who work with disabled women. Disability service providers should collaborate with victim support services, ULOs and DPOs. Furthermore, it is important that all measures to awareness be developed in collaboration with disabled women and with the movement for violence against women to enhance the relevance of the projects. Endorse independent living. Participants in the project emphasised how being dependent upon services and assistance disempowered them and limited their choices. Disability service providers should promote the empowerment of disabled women and discontinue institutions and service arrangements that cultivate and sustain power imbalances between disabled service users and non-disabled service providers. Disability services should promote, fund and execute projects that involve independent living and empowerment strategies such as workshops for disabled women. It is important that empowerment measures be developed in collaboration with disabled women. Develop clear strategies. It is important that disability service providers address the fact that violence happens within the service system. Preventing violence should systematically be implemented in the practices and activities of the services. Service providers should develop protocols or obligatory policies and guidelines to ensure that all instances of violence, reports or cases are identified and investigated. Such guidelines would encourage staff to intervene and be important in the effort to improve users' safety. It is paramount that management levels support the implementation of such guidelines actively. When establishing concrete intervention strategies, users of the services and survivors should be involved. Promote knowledge among staff and other professionals. Disability service providers should promote an attitudinal change within the services and make staff more sensitive about the topic of violence against disabled women. This should be done by providing training about violence against disabled women and accessible support options to all staff who work with disabled women. It is imperative that staff receive training about the rights of disabled people the Social Model of Disability and the CRPD. Training should promote a critical reflection of participants about violence related to power and to what extent dependencies can foster violence and abuse. All training activities should be carried out by or in collaboration with disabled women, survivors and the support system. Recommendations for specialised victim support services. Be prepared and willing to support disabled women. Support services need to define disabled women as a relevant target group and orient and organise their services so that they address gaps and barriers. Organisations have to be willing to undertake necessary changes in order to provide successful and barrier-free support to disabled women. Services should be disability inclusive and designed and implemented in a manner that ensures accessibility for disabled women. Tackle attitudinal barriers and provide disability equality training to counsellors. Many participants in the research, disabled women and service providers alike, agree that there is a general lack of awareness and knowledge among non-disabled counsellors who are currently providing support. Counsellors must have skills necessary to adapt their support to the needs of disabled women and be made aware of issues of power imbalances. Raised awareness of counsellors decreases attitudinal barriers, which is a common hindrance for disabled women who seek support. Victim and women's services need to promote disability equality training on a regular basis for the counsellors preferably in collaboration with disabled women survivors, DPOs or ULOs. 
The training should address the specific situation of disabled women, the different manifestations of violence perpetrated against them, and social model understanding of disability. Provide accessible support. The empirical reports revealed a lack of accessibility in most support service organisations. Victim support and women's services should assess their services to see what degree they still have barriers for disabled women and acquaint themselves with ways to promote accessible and successful support. Facilities of organisations need to be physically accessible as well as providing communication for deaf women and such with cognitive impairments. Furthermore, proactive support out of the counselling room has to be extended, for example in outreach activities in institutions. Also, the services of organisations need to be flexible and counsellors knowledgeable about ways to meet the different needs of disabled women. Furthermore, support services have to address access for deaf women especially and ensure the presence of deaf staff and volunteers as well as members who can sign. Employed disabled women. It is important that victim support and women's organisations have a clear strategy of employment of disabled women and their career progression. Support services should emphasise the participation of disabled women in leadership and management and see to it that they are involved in decision making. This is an important way of ensuring that support to disabled women is grounded in their experiences. Provide services that are successful according to disabled women. Many of the women who participated in the study called for increased peer support and peer counselling. Victim support and women's organisations should recognise disabled women as experts of their own lives and experiences and promote support options that are valued by them. They should promote peer support and form discussion forums and a safe space for disabled survivors and victims where they can meet and discuss their common experiences and the barriers they face in everyday life and services. They should make sure the support for disabled women is always on the terms of the disabled women and not organised based on the views and experiences of the non-disabled counsellors or professionals. Provide accessible information about the services. Disabled women in this study pointed to a lack of information about accessible support services. Victim support and women's services should ensure that information about the counselling and support be made barrier-free. For example, in easy language, video clips, in sign language and audio files. It is important that organisations indicate clearly in what ways their services are accessible. Actively engage in the discussions of violence against disabled women. Participants pointed out that public discussion about violence usually does not reflect the experiences of disabled women and does not take into consideration the disparity and imbalance of power that they experience. Victims, support services and women's organisations should acknowledge oppressive processes of social structures that work against disabled people. They should publicly take a stance with disabled women and partake in awareness raising about violence against them. Support services and women's organisations should participate in awareness raising and projects that increase awareness among general public and specific professional groups that address violence and stereotypes. Furthermore, they should participate in the training of professional groups who work within disability services to promote the knowledge of different manifestations of violence and the proper reactions when such cases arise. Find ways to reach out to disabled women. Findings revealed a notable lack of connection between the disabled women and specialised women's or victim services. They should take measures to bridge the gap between disabled women who need help and support services. They should engage in proactive projects that aim to reach women who need help, 
preferably in collaboration with other DPOs, ULOs or disability service providers. Collaborate with other organisations. CVSSs should work in collaboration with DPOs and ULOs to promote a network of organisations engaged in the fight against violence against disabled women, preferably making a single accessible point of contact. Recommendations for DPOs and ULOs Participate in the fight against gendered violence. Several disabled women who participated in the project felt that DPOs and ULOs do not address gender-based violence adequately. It is important that DPOs and ULOs recognise and advocate for the right of women with disability to live a life free from exploitation, violence and abuse as articulated in Article 16 of the CRPD. DPOs and ULOs should participate in projects that address awareness raising and preventative measures. Collaborate with organisations that provide support to disabled women that have experienced violence. DPOs and ULOs should actively engage in collaboration with victim support services and other organisations that offer support to disabled women who have experienced violence. For example, DPOs could provide support services with disability equality training and help support organisations address necessary accessibility issues. Such collaboration between organisations could promote barrier-free access to victim support and women's services for disabled women. A united effort would also make for a more coordinated lobbying for implementation and funding. Promote information about accessible services for survivors of violence. While many DPOs and ULOs do not have the resources to take on specific aspects of support, they could have an important role in providing information and directing disabled women to accessible support services. DPOs and ULOs should have barrier-free information about the different manifestations about violence and accessible support services and disseminate this information to disabled women. Participants in the project stressed that a collaboration between DPOs, ULOs and organisations of support would help bridge the gap for disabled women who have experienced violence, as ULOs and DPOs could have an important role in directing women to accessible help. Conclusions The seriousness of the violence faced by disabled women was made very clear by all participants. The violence took many forms, was often experienced over the life course in different places and from different perpetrators. Violence was also closely associated with living in institutions and with carers, whether paid to assist or informal family carers. In institutions, violence by inhabitants was frequent as well. Frequently, violence that took place where people lived and associated with those who women were close to, partners, spouses and family members. Violence against disabled women was considered to be higher in all countries than for non-disabled women. Women with sensory impairments, deaf or blind women, women with the label of learning difficulty and migrant disabled women, especially reported in the UK, were considered to be especially at risk. Power imbalances were seen as suppressive mechanisms to expose violence against women and especially against disabled women. Relative powerlessness was identified as stemming from a number of factors, including the perception that women could not fight back, the degree of control exercised over women, as by residential service providers, for example. In all countries, women's access needs were exploited during violence. For example, mobility aids were removed or made ineffective or women were over-medicated. The prevalence of sexual violence in childhood and in adulthood was marked and is cause for particular concern. The still prevailing view of society that disabled women and girls, in particular women with the label of learning difficulty, are asexual, 
facilitates and encourages the crossing of boundaries and the perpetrating of sexual violence. Lack of sex education in childhood was reported by some disabled women in all countries. Because of that, some women reported that they had difficulties understanding about sexual boundaries and recognising sexual abuse. Some women only recognised the abuse later in their lives and their lack of knowledge can only have exacerbated their powerlessness in the eyes of perpetrators. Consequences of violence are very severe. The effects of violence on mental health were catastrophic, but violence was a major cause of other physical and cognitive impairments as well. With regard to impairment-specific abuse, the study revealed that if women acquired their impairments after being in the relationship or the impairment had worsened during the relationship, violence often increased. Given the dependence of disabled women without support on their partners, the use of women's impairment as part of a violent strategy, including isolation, was repeatedly observed. Such a situation makes it very difficult for disabled women to look for assistance, either informal among family members and friends or service providers. They were afraid of losing the support they need to manage their daily life if they disclosed their situation. Disabled women did not have access to proper help for two reasons. First, they often did not have access to specialised women's services or accessible information during or after violence. Apart from physical access problems, professionals pointed out that they have not enough financial resources and did not feel well enough equipped to tackle this issue or create provision. Some did not have enough knowledge about the target group and their needs. For some others, it was argued that their service or refuge would perhaps not be suitable for some groups of disabled or deaf women. For disabled women, the type of support offered by women's organisations or refuges did not always meet their needs because many experienced violence from several different sources. Disability-specific forms of neglect, abuse and violence may not be recognised by victim support or women's services. Therefore, a pressing need is for disabled women to have safe spaces where their experiences will be recognised for what they are and where women can receive practical and emotional assistance. Summing up the importance of knowledgeable personal support from individuals should not be underestimated, especially at pivotal points in women's lives, such as during the process of escaping violent perpetrators. In this context, Assistance through obtaining information about the respective services from a trusted person played a vital role. Several women described the moment when they felt for the very first time that they were being taken seriously and that someone believed them as extremely positive. An important step towards the improvement of the support system for women affected by violence, according to the advisory group and many representatives of specialised victim support services, is the comprehensive and multi-layered networking between relevant services. The reality in most of the countries, however, is that a gulf exists between DPOs and specialised women's services and disabled women often receive no help from either party. Most DPOs often lack recognition of gender-based aspects of violence and specialised services are inaccessible to disabled women. Nevertheless, in the gap, there are a few organisations in each country specifically concerned with addressing the needs of disabled women who have experienced violence. This work needs supporting and funding. An important aspect of this project was also to develop recommendations regarding ways to improve services and facilitate access to supports for disabled women who have experienced violence, as well as to identify preventative measures. Interestingly, and despite the fact that the recommendations came from a diverse group of participants, there were significant overlaps and similarities 
indicating key areas that need attention in addressing how to improve policies and various support services and programmes for disabled women who have experienced violence. In conclusion, a main finding of this project is that successful policy making, planning, developing, implementing and monitoring of initiatives regarding violence against disabled women requires active and meaningful participation of disabled women and survivors themselves at all levels and in all areas. Although in all countries, laws focusing on violence against women and protecting the rights of disabled people are in place, an evident gap emerged when it comes to disabled women exposed to violence. Consequently, a political response is needed. Mainstreaming approaches, improving accessibility and services for all women, and targeted approaches, assistance specifically directed at disabled women, are both necessary. Sufficient funding needs to be made available to specialised services to tackle the problem with its associated emotional, human and financial costs. In the light of the conclusions of the national reports, apparently two areas of concern are identified. There is the need for further investigation into institutional abuse when women are living in residential care facilities and access to justice for disabled women. There are indications from all the countries that problems exist in these areas, but information on the exact issues is still patchy, except in Germany, where recently a study on violence against women living in institutions has been published. Schrottel Honberg, Violence Against Women Living in Institutions, 2014. Given the research so far, especially in institutional settings, the possible imbalance of power between staff members and residents weakens the position of women in terms of self-determination and autonomy and increases the risk of being violated. Examples of the ways that women took more control of their own lives was through gaining personal assistance that could replace the abusive care experienced when living in institutions and being more assertive in their dealings with others. Relating to the issue of access to justice, women's experiences also revealed that in the majority of all cases, no perpetrators were prosecuted or even sentenced. Few women reported their violent experience to the police. Most of them didn't, due to various reasons, ranging from having no support to do so and being scared not to be believed, to being afraid of losing the assistance of my carer, who is often the perpetrator. In particular, the concern of being not believed, dismissed or ignored is a high relevant problem raised by all women in all countries. In summary, it can be said that prevention, the improvement of the situation of disabled women affected by violence and access to support measures, can only succeed if in the future disabled or deaf women and girls are treated equally on all levels, in schools, workplaces, in public and within their families. All women who were interviewed aim to and wish to live in an inclusive society in which being disabled or being a woman were not a barrier to access, safety or life chances anymore. In order to achieve that aim, it is the task and the duty of policy makers to implement adequate measures to fulfil all rights of disabled women, especially guaranteeing a violence-free life. Finally, the project also showed that the interviewed women affected by violence were not just helpless victims or prisoners of comprehensive dynamics of violence, but women with strength and power who, despite experiencing discrimination and violence throughout their lives, were able to save themselves by their own efforts, sometimes even from seemingly severe and hopeless situations. This is exactly where measures should try to connect with the strengths and the self-determined decisions of disabled women. Ultimately, a joint support network with disabled women should be set up that lives up to the rights and goals of equality and self-determination.